Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to share some ideas with you to improve quality of home health care. My first home health assignment was actually in public health as a roster nurse and I provided long hours of care for an ALS patient in her home. While it wasn't all a wonderful experience, most of the time I couldn't believe someone would really pay me to do this. I would have done it as a volunteer. Well, at least in an ideal world where I didn't need money. But once I'd experienced keeping people at home, I never wanted to work anywhere else. I still see keeping people safely at home as the primary reason for home care, and doing the very best we can for each patient is how we do that. Our objectives today are to cite five factors to consider when choosing a home health compare outcome for improvement, identify and construct a focused and effective outcome improvement plan process, and identify the essential measurements needed to evaluate an improvement implementation. I will provide you with background in quality con improvement concepts and give you a nuts and bolts approach to do quality improvement projects in your own agencies. Why do we do quality improvement? Can't we count on well-educated and experienced clinicians to use best practice and clinical skills to improve their patient outcomes? That would be an ideal world, wouldn't it? But clinicians vary in their knowledge and skills and in their critical thinking. Improving outcomes involves more than telling employees to try harder and do better and to use best practices. Change is hard and not done willingly. And what to change or how to change is not always intuitive. In order to make a lasting change to improve any outcome, it needs to be built into the system. Clinicians need education, resources, and support to improve practice. We do improvement projects, first of all, to have better patient outcomes. So many of the improvements worked on in most agencies are to add to the bottom line or to reduce the negatives in the workplace, like an ineffective staffing process. If you always keep the patient in the center of the project, you'll know that this improvement will impact patients and not just the profit and loss statement. Happily, patient outcome improvements often also increase efficiency, lower costs, and improve employee satisfaction as well as patient satisfaction. Accreditation regulation, as well as some state licensure rules, mandate that agencies must conduct quality improvement projects. And while CMS does not mandate agencies use their OBQM or OBQI data for outcome improvement, the possibility of receiving a lower reimbursement than usual because the outcomes are lower than average, as we foresee happening in the future, will certainly be an incentive. So does this look familiar? Management, of course, always wants to think that they provide the best quality. Customers don't always have the same opinion. And staff members frequently are somewhere in the middle. Managers and clinicians work hard at providing the best care they can. Patients and caregivers often have expectations of home health that we're unable to meet due to regulatory and other constraints. Customer satisfaction is their perception of the quality of care. This tells me we need objective data before we can try to improve outcomes. As much as we gripe about collecting OASIS data, it does give us advantage over many other industries in that we have lots of data. We may question its accuracy and actually measuring what they wanted to measure but it's a definite starting point. The history of the quality movement. The outcome movement methods taught by the OBQM and OBQI manuals and the accreditation organization standards are built on improvement methodology used by many industries in many countries. One of the first quality gurus was Dr. W. Edwards Deming, who acted as a consultant to Japan following World War II. 
Most of you are probably not old enough to remember the sarcastic comments that would be made about something made in Japan shortly after the war. Those products were cheap to buy and poorly made, often falling apart after a few uses. What does made in Japan signify now? Off the top of my head, Toyota, Honda, Samsung. It means top brands across the world market. Dr. Deming taught statistical process control methods and management methods that changed the Japanese economy. The National Quality Prize in Japan is still the Deming Prize, named after an American. These methods began to be called total quality management, continuous quality management, or continuous quality improvement. The total quality management reached its Haiti in the United States in the 80s and 90s. As with most new ideas, it started out slowly and gained momentum until nearly everyone was doing quality. Then other initiatives gradually came along. Who moved my cheese? The Seattle fish market approach. Business reengineering. Six Sigma. Some were fads that came and went quickly. Others, such as Six Sigma, have remained viable. But that also uses many of the concepts from total quality management. CMS expectations. Maybe it helps to know that CMS has to do quality improvement too. The government mandates all agencies under the Department of Health and Human Services to have a quality improvement program that contains four goals. They are better care and lower costs, prevention and population health, expanded health care coverage, and enterprise excellence. The CMS publication CMS Quality Strategy 2013 outlines their program. Enterprise Excellence. I like the objectives listed under their Enterprise Excellence goal of having a high quality, diverse workforce. Including diversity often means bringing in more diversity in ideas and methods. Thinking outside the box becomes easier when we're not all just alike, but also better meets the needs of a growing diversity in our patient populations. Developing, supporting, and utilizing innovative strategies, tools, and processes. There's so much that we can't change. It goes without saying that we're a highly regulated industry. There's pros and cons to that. Most regulations are in place to ensure good care and to prevent harm. But do we sometimes forget how to be imaginative in the areas where we can be creative? Collaborating with partners, or as they stated, collaborating effectively with partners and agents to reach goals. With today's costs of providing care and the specialization that has occurred, I believe we've come to a place where we often can't do it all by ourselves. As you consider solutions to agency problems, consider who could partner with you to supply that need. It's a win-win for you both. Driving quality needs to be a core function of home health agency staff, not just management, but all staff. Here's my vision of improving health care outcomes. The patient is the center triangle and needs to be in the center of all improvement efforts. Surrounding the center are the three triangles that make up the worlds of home health care, clinical, financial, financial, and operational. Of course, the model has nice sharp lines between these worlds. In reality, they're pretty fuzzy and move around a lot. At the bottom are the outcomes, decreased costs, improved clinical outcomes, and efficient processes. Because this is so interrelated, you can't just take one piece of the puzzle and ignore the others. And when you achieve better outcomes, the other rewards of lower costs and more efficient processes usually are a pleasant byproduct. There is no universally accepted definition of quality. Manufacturing often uses describe the ability in the process used to create a product and giving more uniform results. Think McDonald's. You get the same taste and appearance in a McDonald's hamburger wherever you go. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best hamburger in the world, but you get what you expect to get with little variability. The service industries often use the concept of delighting the customer. 
In this case, customers have a set of expectations when they order a service. The person will be pretty much on time, will be courteous, and will provide an acceptable service. The customer will be satisfied and may use the company again. However, if the service person arrives exactly on time, does a much better job than expected, does something extra that the customer hadn't even thought about, and charges less than expected, the customer will be delighted. As an example, I recently got an oil change from a Mazda dealer in Phoenix. It was the first time I'd been there, and I didn't have to wait at all. However, the lounge area was small, and they didn't have the fruit and donuts and free bottles of water that the Honda dealer always provides. Then the bill was higher than I'd expected. They didn't push me to get any more service than I really needed, which I liked, so I was feeling pretty neutral about them. Then they brought out my car, and it was shiny clean. Oh, this is getting better. But the kicker was when the salesman said, here, before you leave, I have something for you. He held out a card, and I'm thinking, okay, it's his business card. But when I looked more carefully, it was a punch card. And for the next three years, I will get oil changes for $5 each. Now I'm a delighted customer. Customers in the delighted range will often tell several people of their experience and recommend the company. Satisfied customers will usually not tell anyone. It wasn't exceptional, just okay. But the dissatisfied customers are the most vocal, and they will tell anyone who wants to listen about their gripes. Home health is a service industry, and we can also strive to delight our patients and their families. A recent article in Harvard Business Review discussed improving the quality of health care. Their definition of quality was to maximize the value for patients by achieving the best outcomes at the lowest cost. This more closely matches what CMS expects of our outcome improvement and keeps the patient in the center. But we really need to consider all three types of quality improvement as improving the process to provide the care is what will really improve the quality. And if the patient is left dissatisfied, it won't matter to them that we've done a better process with better patient outcomes on our paper reports. The problems with definitions as applied to home care. We really have to look at the specifics of our own industry when considering various quality approaches. I don't have to tell you about the complexity of providing home care services or the difficulty of measuring patient outcomes. Writing measurable goals for patient outcomes is difficult. Much is out of our control, especially the course of illness and how the patient will react to the care provided. Clinicians come with different educational backgrounds and different types and levels of experience. They provide their care primarily unsupervised and are reluctant to change practice methods. Regulatory issues often are so complex and detailed it overshadows the actuality of patient care. For those reasons, many agencies focus on having clinicians be compliant with the agency processes. Follow the right standardized care plan. Fill in your documentation properly. Turn things in on time. Meet productivity standards. Things don't necessarily influence the outcome for the patient. So which do you do in your agency? Problem solving or process improvement? Probably a lot of both. It's easy, though, to confuse the two. Problem solving is a put out the fire sort of a thing. Think of a large hotel. If there's a fire, no one worries about the quality of service provided to the hotel guests. Get the fire department called. Get the guests out of the building. Make sure the fire door is closed to keep the damage confined to as small an area as possible. And what do we call the days where we don't do anything we'd plan to do because it's a day of minor or sometimes major crises? It's a putting out the fires day. Compare that to process improvement and think again of the hotel. A hotel is made up of many processes. Housekeeping, front desk, purchasing would be a few of the processes we'd be aware of. If a housekeeper quits and the department supervisor has to dry, drop everything to clean rooms, the fire has been put out, and probably the guests never know there's been a problem. However, if the department improves the way they provide the service, you no longer need to wait for a room to be cleaned. 
The room is cleaner than you'd hoped for. There's fresh flowers on the dresser with a welcome note. You'd say, probably you had great service. That's improving their quality outcome. <coughs> what is an outcome? The definition from the OBQI manual is a health status change occurring between two or more time points. The time points are between the start of care or resumption of care and the discharge or transfer OASIS data collection points. Health status changes can be physiologic, functional, cognitive, emotional, or behavioral. That gives us a lot to work with. We aren't held responsible only for contributing to better health. Focusing on functional, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral changes will often affect changes in physical health. The changes between two or more time points are changes that must be intrinsic to the patient. Intrinsic is defined as belonging to the essential nature of the thing. That's a little esoteric, but outcomes might be positive, negative, or neutral. And that's where risk adjustment comes into play. Risk adjustment statistically compensates for differences in patient populations. An agency operating in a small rural town where the population is lower income and education will probably have different outcomes from the same care as an agency operated by an HMO where the members are generally younger, better educated, and receive more preventative medicine. After risk adjustment, these differences in outcomes based on the population differences should be minimized. Outcomes can result either from care provided or from disease progression. What are the OBQI, oh, excuse me, what are some, here are some questions for you. Would the PT, having had grab bars installed during the episode, be considered an outcome? Actually, no. That is a change in the patient's environment, which is not directly related to the patient. It may have a positive effect on the patient outcome, hopefully avoiding falls during toileting or bathing, but it is not a patient outcome in and of itself. Would the healing of a surgical wound during the course of an episode be considered an outcome? This is a yes. It is intrinsic to the patient and a positive outcome. Would an exacerbation of COPD during an episode be considered an outcome? Yes, it is a change in the patient's condition between two time points, even though it's not a positive outcome, and was not a direct result of care provided by the agency. Are assessments, care plans, clinical pathways, costs, or utilization of home care services outcomes? No, these are parts of processes to provide care and can and should be considered during outcome improvement projects, but they are not intrinsic to the patient. What are the OBQI criteria for choosing an outcome? How do you choose which outcome to work on? The OBQI manual lists their criteria for choosing outcomes to improve. Look for statistically significant differences. Those little numbers on the OBQI reports have meaning and can provide direction for choosing outcomes. Look for the most statistically significant. Statistical significance is the probability that an effect or an outcome is not due to just chance alone. In statistics, a result is considered significant not because it is important or meaningful, but because it has been predicted as unlikely to have occurred by chance alone. The probability the result of the measurement occurring by chance is usually set at 5%. So a statistically significant result is one in which the value for obtaining that result is less than 5%. And that's usually expect, expressed as 0 0.05. The notes and directions on the OBQI reports will help you understand which of your scores are statistically significant. You'll want to look at the size and sample used to determine the score. Make sure the outcome is based on an adequate number of cases. 
and look outside the report at your agency's own goals and clinical significance to the population served. Just because the score is most statistically significant does not mean <clears throat> it is the most important outcome to work on for your agency and its population. <coughs> OBQI data is a starting point. But there are things to keep in mind while following OBQI directions. First and foremost is that the data is anywhere between 6 and 18 months old. The outcome data currently provided on Home Health Compare is from October 2012 through September 2013. What has happened in your agency since October 2012 that might make today's data show different results? Is the OBQI and Home Health Compare data still relevant for your agency? But as I said, it's a starting point. There's a lot of data collected, presented, and statistically analyzed for you. It would be stupid not to use it. Start with your OBQI, OBQM, or OASIS team reviewing the reports. Use the criteria to determine which two or three outcomes seem to have the most relevance to your agency's population and goals. But you also need to consider more than just those statistically significant outcomes from OBQI. When you are selecting an outcome for an improvement initiative, there are other things to take into consideration. First, what is your agency's mission, vision, and goals? How do they apply to the potential outcomes you have selected from OBQI or Home Health Compare? What is your patient population? If a less statistically significant outcome is more applicable to your patient population, you might want to choose that rather than the more significant outcome. For example, you have a higher than usual number of orthopedic patients due to your good relationship with a well-known clinic. You have good outcomes in ambulation and pain management but your dyspnea outcome is most statistically significant for improvement. You probably would choose one of the other outcomes more pertinent to your orthopedic patients. Why would you use Home Health Compare? You still want to use the OBQM and OBQI reports as a base as they do give more information about your patient population and agency trends. But I wouldn't exclude Home Health Compare. It's a snapshot of the more complicated reports, and especially because it's what the public views or can view. I would always pay attention to that data, which is within the public view. If it's used as CMX expected, potential users would be online to compare the local agencies and choose the one that best corresponds to their needs. I do have my doubts that it's actually used that way, at least not very regularly. Uh, but that's another story. Home Health Compare also includes the five HCAP measures. For most states, you can see at a glance how your outcomes compare with your state averages and national averages. There is also data available to compare your scores with the averages from the top 20% of agencies nationally. When PPS begins to pay bonuses to agencies that score within the top 20%, you'll want to be in that bracket. I have semi-randomly selected four agencies to look at as examples of what I've covered so far. I wanted agencies from north, south, east, and west as there are regional trends in how OASIS is scored. And I wanted an average agency from each area. I looked at a number of agencies in each region and chose one that was not the highest or lowest in outcome scores. The first is a northern agency. I tried giving them fictitious names, but I guess I'm not very imaginative. Each name I picked out turned to, into being an actual agency somewhere. So they're just going to be north, south, east, and west. The northern agency had only three outcome measures that scored lower in comparison to state and national averages. They were improvement in ambulation, transfers, and healing of surgical wounds. From that choice, or those choices, which outcome would you choose to improve? Of course, the answer is it depends. 
If your patient population had a large number of falls as an issue, I'd look at the falls reports and see where those falls occurred. If they were during ambulation, that would be a good choice for an outcome improvement. If more occurred during transfers, then that would be a better choice. If neither ambulation nor transferring was an issue, your falls primarily occurred in the tub while showering, then perhaps neither of these measures would actually impact that outcome. That doesn't mean that you won't examine that data and look at what can be done to eliminate those falls, but that improvement effort would not necessarily be linked to an outcome, but probably more to your OBQM reports. If the agency had frequent surgical patients, that would be my first choice. If they did not see many surgical patients, my second choice would be transferring. It's where patients often fail to use their assistive devices, ask for assistance, and sit in those favorite chairs that are hard to get up from. But your own patient data will tell you more, and you'll want to go back to the OBQI and OBQM reports to learn more. The Western Agency has lots of potential improvement opportunities to choose from. Three ADLs, ambulation, transfer, and bathing. Two pain-related interventions and pain with activity. Improvement in healing of surgical wounds. Two for improvement in pneumonia and flu immunizations. And one management of oral meds. The lowest score compared to the state average is management oral of oral medications at 77% of the state average, although that's not counting the two immunization measures. And why am I not counting those? Because the usual reason for low scores with these measures is clinicians don't find them relevant. A short education during team meetings to make sure they understand how to correctly respond and where information can be obtained goes a long way. Those scores can be improved quickly. Knowing these outcomes are measured across the continuum of health care helps. CMS is not just picking on home care, and also they appear on the public reports. Post the current scores and the goal, do another check in one month, and notice that I said current scores. Before starting any education for clinicians, make sure you've done a focused audit on a number of current discharged patients to get real-time data and know that it's still a current problem. So what would your choice be? Again, it's going to depend upon your agency and population. Do you have a lot of surgical patients? Do an audit on current charts to see if there is a pattern of premature discharges. But be careful with this measure. Many agencies score lower here because their usual practice is to discharge when there is consistent healing taking place. The potential for complications is low. The patient or caregiver can demonstrate wound care competency, and they know what signs and symptoms to report to the physician. So even though the score may look low, you would not want to change a good practice just to get a better score on paper. As we said earlier, the immunizations seldom need a formal improvement effort. Do you have a lot of rehospitalizations? What is the primary reason? Medical management is one of the top problems sending patients back to the hospital. If that's true in your agency, management of oral medications may be a good choice. Do many of your patients live alone and have difficulty performing their ADLs safely? That might lead you to ambulation, transfer, or bathing. What do your incident reports have to add to this data? Do your patient satisfaction reports indicate problems with pain management? Just as you customize a standardized care plan for the patient, the improvement measures need to be customized for your agency. The Eastern Agency is pretty clear cut. Two outcome measures related to pressure ulcer interventions. Um, first, did you put the appropriate intervention into the plan of care? And second, did you do what you say you were going to do? Both are process measures. Neither asks, did the pressure ulcers improve, but did your staff follow best practices? Another process measure is the frequency of use of the multi-factor fall risk assessment. The last measure 
shows how consistently your clinicians provided medication education to the patient and or the caregiver. Your choice. Here your choices for process improvement are much more limited. Pressure ulcer interventions and putting the interventions on the plan of care can be a pretty easy educational effort with clinicians. The multi-factor fall risk assessment is also straightforward, making sure you have an approved assessment and doing some additional education with clinicians to make sure they're using it and they're using it properly. That leaves providing education, education to patients and caregivers. That will take more effort and would make a good process improvement project. The Southern Agency had only two measures. In this case, state averages were not available. The improvement in transfers was only slightly below the national average, but more significantly below the national top 20 average. Inclusion of pressure alter interventions is considerably lower than the national average. So which to choose here? In this case, a short process improvement to make sure clinicians understand and are in compliance with this process would be beneficial. Then additional time can be spent on transfers. Choosing an outcome from Home Health Compare may not be the best use of time and resources for this agency. I would have them do further analysis of their OBQM and OBQI reports and probably that will provide direction for outcome improvement that would make a more lasting improvement in patient-centered outcomes. Remember the overarching goal and that for any improvement outcome is to improve both the efficiency and the excellence of care provided to agency patients. This encompasses both process and outcome measures. I've mentioned several times the need for real-time data. In manufacturing industries, that might mean same-day data. In home care, particularly while working with the CMS definition of outcomes, we need a time period encompassing two OASIS data collection points. <coughs> So for the OBQI and Home Health Compare Outcomes, we will be working with recently discharged patients. That means we'll be looking at data up to two months old. While it's not ideal for process improvement, it's much more real-time than the 6 to 18 month old data provided by CMS. Sometimes you will need to develop an audit tool for the outcome and related OASIS items and start from scratch. Other times you may be able to use data already collected, <clears throat> such as quarterly util utilization review results, incident reports, or hand washing and fall data. If you can time things right, you can build in additional questions to your UR tools and accomplish both audits at the same time. This would be a good opportunity to use the first of the tools we'll be discussing, a control chart. When you do your audit, you may be looking at each visit record to see if medications and compliance review were a part of the note. When you complete each record, a percent score can be obtained by dividing the number of times meds were addressed by the total number of visits. The results of all the audits can be plotted on a graph. If you have access to a statistical program, the graph can include the upper and lower limits which is expressed in terms of standard deviations from the mean. The chart will tell you if you have very little variation from the mean, and that would indicate your clinicians operate in a similar fashion. However, if your results show some very high percentages, some very low, and a bunch in the middle, those outside your control limits are called special causes. In this case, you might quickly notice that one clinician scores near 100% on all patients, while another is erratic, some high, some average, and some low, 
and the third is uniformly low. When you design a real-time data collection, there is no predefined size of sample to use other than some complicated statistical equations that researchers use. And I couldn't begin to explain how to use those because I don't understand them either. A good rule of thumb is to use a sample size similar to the number of records reviewed for your quarterly UR. If the results of your real-time data analysis <coughs> supports the need for improvement <coughs> excuse me, of the recommended outcome, the next step is to charter a process improvement. Bring your data analysis and requests for the chosen outcome improvement to your management team. It's their responsibility to review your data and make the final decision on how to use agency time and resources for a quality improvement effort. The charter is an actual written document. You have an example of a charter in the handouts. It should include the specific outcome for improvement in the scope of the project. Defining the scope means not only what it will encompass, but also what it won't encompass. It sets the boundaries for your work and keeps the project from flowing out into more areas and eventually becoming unmanageable. It should also include a timeline to keep the group's work efficient and on track. It will include approval for the resources you expect to need during the improvement effort and reporting expectations. How often does the management team want to hear how you're doing and what you've accomplished so far? Unless you have a very small management team, you will usually have one person who will become the champion for the project. The champion will serve as a liaison between the process improvement team and the larger management team. The champion may or may not sit in on process improvement team meetings or may want regular meetings with or reports from the team leader. The champion should be notified whenever you have unexpected issues or problems arise. He or she is the person to go to when you may need additional time or resources. Above all, you don't want to do your whole project and then let your management team know that you've spent twice as much or that your improvement implementation didn't show the expected improvement at the end of the project rather than providing progress reports as you go along. Make sure you keep them in the loop. I'm going to take one example from the four agencies discussed earlier. I chose the management of oral medications from the Western Agency. Although I don't have any OBQI data or real-time data to support this choice, my rationale is that accurate medication use is one of the most important things we can address in home care. Noncompliance by forgetting doses or doubling doses is not uncommon. Many patients aren't able to afford all their medications. Others just aren't moved to comply accurately. The effects of inaccurate medication use is compounded by drug interactions and side effects. And this outcome can affect many other outcomes. The actual process of setting up and managing outcome improvement will apply, apply to any outcome, but I'll use the medication management as an example. This PDCA cycle diagram is probably familiar to most of you. There are some variations, but the basic idea is that planning, doing, which is implementing the intervention that you hope will improve the outcome, checking, which is measuring the results of the new intervention, and acting, which is either fully implementing the new process or making changes based on the test results is a continuous cycle. This concept is why many companies use the title of continuous quality improvement rather than total quality improvement. Even in cases where your initial test of your new process shows definite improvement and you're ready to roll it out to the full agency, you're never really done. What is a great intervention this month may change with a new best practice or a change in your population. 
So you never sit back and say, well, this is done forever. So we'll say you've chosen medication management from OBQI. It's also a part of Home Health Compare. It fits into your agency's vision of keeping your patients at home in optimal health and safety. Your real-time data collection shows that the poor results shown on the OBQI report haven't improved by themselves. Your project has been charted and your champion is telling you to get going. The next step is to choose a process improvement team. You don't want to base the selection on who might have more time available. To make sure you don't waste time for yourself and anyone else associated with the project, you want to select the right people, use the right process, give team members the right training, and make sure you have the right management support in place. The team leader needs to be someone who can be passionate about the need for improvement. It's helpful to have someone who has had previous experience with process improvement efforts. But if your choice is between someone who understands quality improvement but has little interest in medication management, or someone who clearly sees how this affects your patient population and what improving this outcome could mean to your patients and families, I choose the person with the passion. Then you and the champion will need to make sure the team leader is given enough time and resources to adequately lead the project. Team members should include any discipline who would be involved with medication management in the field. A nurse and physical therapist both do frequent admissions and medication management is included in their scopes of practice. Occupational therapy may be involved to assist a vision impaired or other functionally impaired patients to devise systems to increase their medication accuracy. Depending on your patient population, a social worker may have frequent involvement to arrange for low-cost medication programs. Or home health aid may be included if the patient, patient population requires situations where aides are routinely involved in delegated medication administration or reminders. Some agencies may have access to a pharmacist or an assistant. Keep your team to a small enough number to be able to move through the improvement phases rapidly, but still large enough to be able to delegate follow-up work assignments. Hopefully your champion will provide the right management support. It's nice if the champion also has some knowledge of the issues involved with the selected outcome and interest in the problem. Make the champion aware of who is involved as team members. Provide regular reports on progress and problems encountered. If unanticipated needs arise, make requests quickly and avoid last minute pleas for help. The right process, as previously discussed, will help the project progress smoothly and avoid at least some of the unexpected bumps. During team discussions, many other issues will emerge and attention will be drawn to other areas needed improvement. Keep in mind your charter guidelines that will also help keep the team on track. The good ideas and issues should be documented and saved for later attention and frequent reminders will probably be necessary to keep the team on track with the outcome improvement in the Charter. Before a team has their first official meeting, the team members who have never participated in a process improvement project will need training. If the team leader lacks prior experience, it would be beneficial to pair the leader with either a champion who understands the improvement process or another individual within or outside the agency to act as a mentor. There are many good handbooks designed for leading process improvement projects which give a good overview of the process, the related tools, and ideas to help move forward with change. Team members new to quality improvement should have a training session that addresses the concepts of process improvement to improve quality of outcomes and the tools that will be used during the project. These will include the control chart we discussed earlier, 
as well as others commonly used in the process improvement, such as a check sheet, a cause and effect diagram, a Pareto chart, a histogram or scatter, grand, scatter diagrams, or a bar chart. Explain the charter, the role of the champion, the expectations of the project, and what role each will play in the process. At the first team meeting, make participants comfortable and feel valued. A quick introduction as an icebreaker is good even for those team members who know each other well. Asking each person to share a short story of how they helped improve something in the past, work or non-work related, can bring up some interesting and often funny stories. Discuss the reason you're together and what you expect to accomplish. Be clear on how long you expect the project to take and about how much time each person will need to participate. Having the champion present for at least the first meeting can help to legitimize the project and reassure participants they will be allowed enough time to do follow-up work. That will probably mean decreasing productivity expectations on meeting days or during times when participants will be doing follow-up work. I strongly advise having ground rules. A guideline for developing ground rules is included in your handouts. Allow a little time for discussion and add rules if all agree. Some groups need to pro post them on a flip chart and have them visible at each meeting. That will depend upon the composition of your group. You may appoint or ask for a volunteer to take meeting minutes. That allows the team leader to focus on the process and keep the meeting moving. The first step is to flowchart the process. Don't be surprised if there are disagreements on the car how the current process is done. Make sure they understand you're not charting what should be done but what is currently being done. During the meeting, you'll probably not try to use actual flowchart symbols. The easiest way is to have large sticky notes and write down one step per note. That way you can stick them on flowchart pages or onto a whiteboard and easily add or delete steps or rearrange the order. When most agree the process is outlined in detail the way it's currently done, the team leader can take the sheets and transfer to a traditional flowchart format. But don't throw out the stickies. You'll have need for those big sticky notes later. How will you decide when to schedule your next meeting? Your improvement process will be more effective if you keep the momentum going. Allow enough time for the team leader to prepare or for team members to complete any assignments given. If possible, meeting twice a week keeps the project fresh in participants' minds and makes for more effective meetings in a shorter timeline. Remember to report back to the champion after each meeting, or at least send a copy of the meeting minutes. The meeting should be prepared and distributed to team members at least a day or two in advance. A blurb in an agency newsletter or an announcement at a staff meeting is a good idea so that other staff understand who is involved with the project and what it's all about. Here's just a very quick example of a flow chart. You might never have thought that turning on and off the water is actually a process. And depending on the use of the water, this process might be improved. Breaking it down into the details shows where the choices are made and how variation can occur. It assumes you have a faucet to turn on. But what if, like my grandmother when I was young, your only water support source was a pump in the kitchen, and it didn't give both hot and cold water? The setting for your hot water heater will influence on how much cold you need to add. And what the water is going to be used for will determine when the temperature needs to be. If you're going to drink the water, you probably won't want to add any hot. If you're washing your hands, you're probably OK with a wide range of temperatures. But what if the water will be used in some sort of manufacturing process? The temperature used may have an effect on the final product. Then maybe you'll want to add a step to the process of measuring the temperature of the water. When you flowchart a process, get it as detailed as possible. This will make it easier to find all the improvement possibilities. For your second meeting, or wherever you happen to be in the process at this time, because you may have more or fewer meetings than suggested here, depending on your project or your team members. Review the flowchart. Team members may need prompting to remember how the flowchart works if its use is not familiar. 
you're now ready to start looking at ways to improve the process leading to your outcome. But you don't have to invent this particular wheel from scratch. You are undoubtedly familiar with QIOs, or quality improvement organizations. They contact, contract with CMS and were formerly known as peer review organizations. The name was changed in 2002 to reflect their added focus on continual quality improvement in healthcare. There are 53 QIOs and a list with website links is available on Wikipedia under QIOs. Some of examples of the materials already available are the Oral Medication Workbook, which is a free download from the QIO for Kansas, and Best Practices for Improvement in the Management of Oral Medications, featuring QMAP tools and a staff competency clinician test. And those are free downloads from Stratus Health, which is the QIO for Minnesota. The team leader should do a search and select several resources from QIOs or other sources and have copies available prior to the meeting. Using the resources along with team ideas, start a brainstorm session. One way to introduce this is to suggest you are looking for things that might be helpful if we were in a perfect world. Otherwise, many ideas provoke arguments. We can never do that because one person may suggest the process would work better if only one person were to provide care for that discipline per patient. Immediately you will hear, but we have so many good part-time people, we can't fire them all, or the union wouldn't allow that. It's too much for one person in a complex patient, and on and on. The reply could be certainly those are all true, but what if we worked in a perfect world and we didn't have to worry about any of those things? then could we consider that? Once participants are open to new possibilities, you can start to look at how the agency might obtain that advantage in your world working around your very own constraints. Perhaps you won't use only full-time staff members, but you might decide only full-time clinicians can be case managers. A cause and effect diagram, also known as a fishbone diagram, can be used to stimulate ideas as well as document contributions. Trying to keep participants positive and involved can be a challenge. Another help is the use of a parking lot. This is just a sheet from a flip chart labeled parking lot. When an issue or idea arises that is not really pertinent, it can be written on the parking lot for future reference. Keep it posted at each meeting. Sometimes what looks relevant at the time can fit in later. Or it can become another process improvement effort. The important thing is that all ideas will be addressed eventually and the person contributing the idea feels valued rather than put down. So no matter how off the wall the idea seems to be to you, take it seriously put it on the parking lot, and eventually let that person know why the idea was not used and the rationale behind it. And then, of course, remember to share the progress with the agency staff at least weekly. Here's an example of a fishbone diagram. The fishbone can consolidate main ideas from a brainstorm session. The typical example includes the categories related to equipment, process, people, materials, environment, and management. Leave the categories blank if they don't apply to your issue. But it is a good way when you realize that one or two of the bones in the fish chart seem to contain all of your comments, you'll be able to hone in on, okay, it is the people involved in the process, and they need new equipment. By your third meeting, or perhaps a fourth, depending on the complexity of your process, you'll be able to finish your brainstorm. The desired result is to have as many viable ideas as possible, even if they are still high in the sky stage. Have team members compare the brainstorm results with the current flowchart process. How can these ideas fit into the flowchart? As a preparation for the next meeting, the team leader may wish to assign literature searches on improvement ideas to members of the team. 
Mind mapping is a technique used to stimulate creativity. You are not trying to have a neat and organized page of ideas. A central idea or problem can be listed. After that, anything that is contributed is written down. Some ideas will connect to others, and lines can start to be drawn to be um, connecting them. Without having to be logical to present an idea, crazy things will start to pop up. And that is really the intention of this exercise. Don't reject anything. Even the craziest suggestion may apply to something later that can work to get the desired outcome. Another template that can be used is a similar technique, but a little bit more controlled and might be easier for, for participants to follow. You might have several sheets going at once with different problems or issues on each. Eventually, you will look for connections and combinations here as well. On your fourth meeting, have team members report back on their best practice research. Remember, best practice is not just what your team thinks would be best. It is practice that has been studied and evaluated and can be expected to be replicated. Integrate the literature search findings and ideas from the QIOs into the brainstorm ideas. While there may be several main ideas the team feels are worth testing, try to do no more than one at a time unless the interventions planned are similar and can be combined. So how do you decide which improvement ideas to implement and evaluate? One way is to have a flip chart for each main idea. Provide small stickies for team members. Each person has three stickies, numbered 1, 2, and 3. They get up and place their numbered stickies on their first, second, and third choice sheets. If the team is reluctant to vote in front of other team members, each person can have a sheet of paper labeled 1, 2, and 3 and can write in their top three idea choices anonymously. Then the ballots can be turned into the team leader who will analyze and combine the results. Some teams work fine with a show of hands. When the vote is completed, the team member can calculate the results at the time or have them ready for the next meeting. Close the meeting with an explanation of how you will test the chosen idea, who may be involved with the test implementation, and how long the test will last. Announce the results from your vote at your fifth meeting if that was not done at the previous meeting. Today's task is to design the process improvement details. You may have complaints from members who didn't get their first choice. A reminder that it was a vote and reference to ground rules may be needed. The focus of the meeting will be to work out the details of how to implement the change or changes to your process. Pull out the flowchart again and redesign the process with your new intervention. Be as detailed as possible. Here's where saving those big sticky notes helps. Then all you need to do is create additional notes with the new implementation steps. Before you can trial your new process, you will need to determine how many clinicians will try out the new process. Another rule of thumb, the more complex the change, the smaller the trial. You might want one clinician with one patient. You'll be surprised at what you learn. If possible, use a clinician from the team who already understands the what's and why's. Implement the new process small trial for a week and have the clinician report back. Remember the PDCA cycle? You're now at the do stage. Decide what the trial clinician will measure and how. It might be as simple as a check sheet with one week grid days of the week squares for how many visits are planned, and how many visits was the clinician implementing the change. Just use simple hash marks. 
Additional information could be the time involved. Was using the new process shorter or faster than the old? Add a line for the number of minutes, plus or minus. A subjective rating might be helpful as well. Did the patient or caregiver seem to understand? Or was there confusion on their part? And provide a space for comments and recommendations. What could be done differently? This is just a very simple checklist. You would perhaps put your implementation steps, your minutes, whatever you're wanting to measure down the left column, and then hash marks can go in the squares next to those. Keeping the data collection as simple as possible will mean you get more data from clinicians too busy to fill out one more complicated form. By your sixth meeting, you should have just completed the initial trial. The clinician will report back on the measurements taken during the trial and share their recommendations. This is the check portion of the cycle. If things went smoothly and the results were as expected, it's time to expand the trial. It could go to the same clinician now with all patients he is or she is seeing in the next week, or perhaps a clinician from each involved discipline can participate. The process goes back to the do stage, and all involved will start to collect the same data unless changes in the process have been decided. If you've made changes, then you also need to readjust your measurement check sheet. Decide upon the length of this trial. Will you get enough data in one week to make a decision? This is also a good time to let agency staff know that the team has made changes to this process and which clinicians will be involved with the testing. But don't get into too much detail. By the seventh meeting, we're back to check again. Make the changes to the implementation that came out of the larger trial. Unless there are major changes where you're going to go back to the do stage with another test implementation, you're ready to design the rollout to the agency. And here's the act part of the cycle. Think about what you've learned during the project. How much do you want the clinicians to know? Change is not an easy adaptation for most people, and more knowledge usually helps that adaptation. How will you educate the rest of the clinicians? A handout? Meetings? Email messages? Maybe an online video? Are there any new forms? Are there new patient education materials involved? How will you get them to all the involved clinicians? Will your implementation change anything in your assessment or visit records? Can it be done online? Or, if you're an on-paper agency, who will make sure the new forms are being used? If you've done chart auditing, and I'm sure you all have, you'll know that you come across forms that you thought you discontinued two years ago in current chart audits. So that's not an easy task. What will you want all clinicians to measure? How long will you have the measurement take place? If your plans exceed your projections made on the charter, make sure your champion is involved in providing permission for additional resources and clinician time. At about two months after the all-agency rollout, have your team do an audit using the same tool used at the real-time audit. The team leader will present the compiled audit results. A graph of measurement variables can help with the presentation, perhaps using a histogram or scatter diagram. The team will do an analysis and decide if the implementation of the new process has met the goals of the project. If it has, you're done. Have a party. If not, you'll want to determine if the process was actually followed as designed 
or if the implementation just didn't change the outcome. And you'll need to make a decision about what else could be done, perhaps using the parking lot, and go back to that PDCA cycle. And now you really understand why it's a cycle. You don't go around just once. The challenges of implementation. Despite how much complaining staff may have done about anything that appears to not make sense or cause them extra work in the past, if you announce you're going to change it, they'll complain about that too. No, I don't know your staff, but I know myself and I don't think I'm very atypical. None of us really like change. <clears throat> we may like the results of the change, but going through change alters our routines and it's annoying. But there are some things that you can do to make the change process easier for your staff. Look at the curve in the change model. Excuse me. I am on my wrong slide and we're going to go back to this one which is slide 51. This is the bar graph and probably the most simple graph to use to show your project results. I would use two colors. One bar representing the baseline data you obtained when you started your project. The second color will represent the data obtained in your final audit after the all agency rollout. As an example, you might have chosen to measure the percent of visits in the episode when the clinician did medication reconciliation, medication teaching, or check the patient's medication compliance. Perhaps your first bar would have 40% of all visits involved some type of medication assessment or teaching. Hopefully your results after your implantation will be higher than that and your second bar may show 70 to 80 percent of all visits addressed medication issues. If not, back to the PDCA cycle. And now we'll look at the challenges of implementation in the change model. Everyone starts out in stage one. There are obviously some people that are more amenable to change and, and people who definitely enjoy new change. But for the most of us, we start out, status quo is okay. It's not perfect, it's not terrible, but it's okay. And th for some, changing that status quo will put them into a fairly emotional shock and denial stage. As you begin to implement the change, you can expect anger and fear in stage two. You're disrupting their usual routines. Stage three, people are starting to see that, well, maybe this isn't so bad. And yeah, I think I could do that. And by the time you've hit stage four, you have a staff that is now committed to the new way of doing things. It would be nice if you could just tell your staff what a great project you've done and explain how much better this will work and, and they'll want to jump right on the bandwagon. But that's not going to happen. So cut them some slack. As leaders, you will often by nature be more open to change. Staff have a greater vested interest in status quo. So remember when you do the rollout, you are working with people who are back in stages one and maybe some in two. So that's one reason you want to share as much as you can about your project as you go along so that your staff may have started entering the exploration stage before they need to be actively involved. But don't expect them to be in the place you're at and remember you had to go through the stages too. Allow them the time to do that. You can accelerate their change though. And if you look at this graph, you'll show that the arrow pointing to the first curve shows accelerated change. And it's a narrower curve 
than the second one, which is unmanaged change. That shows that there was a shorter time period that the staff needed to adjust than usual. Another way of looking at change is that your staff in that status quo period are frozen. That they're, they're sort of um, content with their ways and not open to new things to do. After you've managed that change, you can find then that your staff are in that middle section, unfrozen and willing to look at doing things differently. But make the most of that time because you can see what happens next. The new process becomes frozen and you will encounter the same resistance as you did originally when you try to change that someday. So here are some of the ways you can manage change. Anticipate. Expect that your staff will not appreciate what you're doing for them or for their patients. Understand the dynamics of change. It'll be easier to not take it personally. Even though it sounds and feels like a personal attack at times, it's really an expression of fear. Fear of incompetence, of more work than they're able to do, or perhaps for some than they want to do. Um, for some, perhaps even a fear of losing their job. It's vital that no one feels put down for expressing doubts or anger. If you experience disrespectful or unprofessional behavior, it needs to be dealt with on a one-to-one -one basis without showing your annoyance in front of others. Express understandings with the feelings rather than focusing on the concepts. When staff feel supported, they'll have an easier time accepting change. Good communication from the inception of the project allows some gradual adjustment before it becomes a necessity. You may have the really angry and threatened staff member who acts out in team meetings, complains to all around, and generally becomes a very disruptive influence in your department. And I've had that person. I've had more than one of those persons. <laughs> But I've also had good results by allowing that person to come into my office and to say anything without fear of reprisal. But the caveat was she could only do this in my office with the door closed. I made sure that regardless of the language used, and it wasn't always pretty, I think actually it was a test to see if I'd really let her do that, I listened to her respectfully. Sometimes what she said did make some sense and I made sure it was presented to the group, although in a fairly different manner than she used. Eventually she became a supporter and much more professional in the group setting. Be creative, but above all don't get into a power struggle. You might win the battle, but you won't win the war. And your goal is to have an agency that continually improves and one way to do that is to build in continued process measurement. Have a goal to make your agency uh, as familiar with process improvement as possible. Rotate as many staff as you can through improvement projects. It's good to have one or two team members who have prior experience to help the project move along more smoothly. Generally, it will take participation on three outcome improvement projects to be very comfortable with the process. And those will be the people that you might look at to develop more team leaders. For those not involved with the team effort, individuals can be asked to provide measurements of something important to their discipline. Having routine one-on-one -on -one meetings monthly with each clinician allows the opportunity to explore what processes are core to their practice and look for areas where they can collect measurements and offer improvement suggestions. After that improvement is in place, you can work together to pick another area for improvement. What a much better approach than blaming the person 
and giving lectures on doing it better. And the combination of individual improvement projects and team projects develop the attitude of how can we do it better rather than grumbling about the present.